Hello, this is Eric. Today is January the 5th, 2023. And we'll be continue talking about the Holy Spirit. In a previous class, we had already mentioned a few, a few of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. And in this class, we will continue uh, going over these attributes. Okay, so there's a lot to be addressed, to be approached in this class. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to you know, to show all of these attributes in this class, but I'm going to do my best, I promise. Okay, so, uh, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is also identified as the divine paraclete, the comforter. This is a translation of the original Greek term for paraclete, comforter. Uh, and he is the comforter in the Christian's daily lives. Okay, so what does it mean exactly? And again, we're going to read a lot of verses in the Bible, but let's keep going here. So, um, the Holy Spirit will accompany and bring comfort to the Christians. Let's read John 14, verse 16. John. Oh my gosh, I never remember the, the numbers. 14:16, right? Let's go. 14:16. And it says, "And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, another comforter." Um this is where you find the, the term paraclete, that he may abide with you forever. Abide with you. So the Holy Spirit, um, in his economic role, uh, he's called to abide with us, to accompany us, to bring comfort to us. Uh, let's check Acts 9.31. Acts 9.31. And it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So the churches walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Okay? All right. Let's keep going here. Um The Holy Spirit also assists God's children in their, oops, let me type here, in their weaknesses, struggles, and trials. Let's read Romans 8:26. Romans chapter 8, oops, 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Right? So the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Okay? Um, we also have Ephesians 3, 16. Let's read it also. 3... Ephesians 3, 16, right? Let me check here. 16, yeah. Okay. Let's read 14 to 16. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened, with might, through his spirit in the inner man. Okay? Uh, so, as we could read here, um, you know, the spirit gives us strength. Let's read it again here. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened. So, he gives us strength. With might, 
through his spirit in the inner man. Right? Inner man. This is basically our conscience, our soul. Okay? Uh, so this is a work uh, performed by the Holy Spirit. And finally, the Holy Spirit teaches the children of God the way of the new covenant. Well, this is quite important. And I want to add a few notes here. Let's first um, read Hebrews 8 verses 10, 11, and 13. Hebrews 8, 10, 11, and 13. Let's read it here. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, uh, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. And 13, in that he says, A new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Well, folks, we have here a very important portion of the scripture concerning the new covenant. As you know, in the old covenant, uh, we basically had commandments like do's and don'ts, right? Basically, the, uh, the old covenant, as we're going to uh, read in Galatians, for example, uh, it was a tutor. Paul is going to describe, you know, the, the the law of Moses as a tutor, because humanity was at that time in its minority. They were like children that needed guidance. So the law worked as a tutor to the to the to the humanity of that time, to Israel at that time, right? But uh, in the fullness of time, when Jesus came, um, and after he uh, fulfilled everything that should be fulfilled in him, we received a new covenant. And what is um, the, the character, uh, you know, the meaning of that new covenant? This is what we read here in Hebrews that actually is mentioning Jeremiah 31, 31, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, you should check that. You should check that. Um, so we read here, uh, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those, uh, after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So, in the New Covenant, guys, uh, God said that he, will, he would put his laws in the people's minds and write them on their hearts, not on stones or paper anymore. So, as a consequence, as a result of that, no one uh, participating in this New Covenant would have to follow commandments like telling, uh, like telling his neighbors, uh, do that, do these, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this. This is what is implied here. Know the Lord, for all shall know me. All those in this new covenant, when the new covenant is totally part of their beings, all of them shall, shall know God, from the least of them to the greatest of them. And this part is very important. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. So nowadays, we have this strong movement. And not only nowadays, okay, guys. Uh, you know, along the history of church, we... Uh, 
we have seen the church often resorting to the old covenant. And the church uh, did that a lot and still does that in, in its history. Um, sometimes uh, by picking elements from the old covenant that are interesting for it, and sometimes literally surrendering to the old covenant, right? So when you have, and we're going to be discussing that in more details ahead, but when you have churches preaching the tithe, uh, they are basically uh, resorting to the Old Testament. Why am I telling you that? Because when they don't understand that the tithes uh, were part of the rudiments of the law and that uh, they grew uh, to, the, uh, to the essence of what God has in mind concerning uh, the, the act of, of offering to the Lord. And that happened in the New Testament. When they don't understand that uh, in the New Covenant, you are called not only to give your 10% and feel happy and satisfy it with that because you did what you had to do, but now you understand that in the new covenant, you have to give with all your heart, with all, um, with all your, um, your gratitude towards the Lord. And it is not 10% only anymore. It is what the Lord puts in your heart. You, you're going to do what the Lord uh, orders you, commands you to offer in your heart. So it's not really a law. It is something that you will do because you love the Lord and are going to do that uh, with a happy and grateful heart towards the Lord and not limited to the 10%. So it goes far beyond the types. And then the church will uh, threat you saying that if you don't do that, if you don't give the types, you're going to be uh, reached by all those curses involve, involving the types in the, in the Old Testament. And that is a lie. I'm just taking that as an example, okay? Okay. Um, I'm, prob I'm probably going to be talking more about this specific theme of the tithes, but I'm picking this as, a, as an example here to, to show you how evil it is to, uh, you know, from pastors to condemn, you know, the, the, the church, uh, you know, the herd of the Lord with these curses of the old covenant that has become obsolete so now we are under a new covenant a covenant uh based on the grace of christ on the on the grace of god show it at the at the calvary okay so uh this is just one example but you you can probably uh see on the internet uh on your television Pastors that are more and more resorting to the old uh, things uh, of the old covenant. You know, they dress like priests in the Old Testament and they had, they use all, you know, those things from the Old Testament uh, that appear to be holy or holier, right? And that is not right. You know, we are under a new covenant. We are all the all the symbols, all the shadows and the figures that pointed to Jesus in the Old Testament found in Jesus its their substance. So we no longer need to resort to those things from the old covenant. It became obsolete. It's over. It vanished away. We are now under a new covenant covenant and we'll be talking about this new covenant in more detail in future classes but the the essence of this new covenant is here in these verses that we have already read 
So let's move on. Economic aspects of the spirit with a view to fulfilling God's purpose. So the spirit shed. This is another thing I would like to draw your attention to. Okay, When we read about the spirit uh, being poured, being shed, we must understand that this is an anthropomorphic language. Obviously, guys, because uh, God is and the whole creation is connected to God so God feels everything you know God feels everything everything the whole creation is connected to God so God doesn't have to be shed but this is described this way uh, only to uh, reveal this economic aspect of the spirit so let's take a look here at Matthew 3. 11 so we can have an idea of what i'm trying to say here matthew 3 uh, we're gonna do it step by step it's a lot of information so no 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 rush here okay no haste i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Normally when Christians, uh, especially the new Pentecostal ones, read about this fire, they uh, relate that you know, to uh, all those uh, manifestations, like you know, people falling on the ground, people uh, like, yelling or talking in speaking in tongues you know all the thing but this is not the case here and it's pretty clear in the next verse we're going to read it just to uh, to get the detail here concerning the fire so his swinowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but take a look here. But he will burn up the chef with unquenchable fire. So fire here is has nothing to do with these manifestations I've just mentioned. Fire here is basically the unquenchable fire of the Lord that is going to burn all the things inside us, in our inner man, that are evil and that have to be destroyed. Right, and it is also uh, intrinsically uh, linked to the Holy Spirit. So He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus uh, will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And here we have uh, something that is really, really uh, complex for some people to understand it is not complex indeed but because of the christian movement the the evangelical the the pentecostal and the new pentecostal movement because of these two movements it um you know something that is so clear has become uh, complicated and has gone far from the truth, from its original meaning. And this is basically the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I don't know uh, where you came from, or what your background is in terms of the gospel. But I, in my own experience, uh, started in a Baptist church uh, where apparently speaking in tongues uh, was being baptized with the Holy Spirit and automatically it meant that it was a privilege for a few, right? Uh, you basically, I basically uh, used to see only the pastors and a few people among the congregation speaking in tongues, which was supposed to be uh, the way that they were manifesting the fact they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then I moved on to the new Pentecostal uh, church. Uh, it, it was a denomination called Adonai here in Brazil. And um, in that denomination, they preached 
that everyone, not only the pastors and um, you know some leaders, but everyone should be uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, it is a little better. We're gonna see that. Uh, we're gonna see and understand why I'm saying that. But what they understood as being baptized with the Holy Spirit was that uh, everyone should speak in tongues. The speaking in tongues was the clear manifestation of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, that became a challenge for me because I saw people speaking in tongues and I didn't understand how that worked. Should I start saying something? Yes, that's what they said, you know, start speaking, start speaking and the Holy Spirit will guide you and when you realize in a glimpse, you're going to be speaking in tongues. So I induced my mind, even unaware of that, that I should speak in tongues uh, by speaking a lot of things and let the Spirit guide me, which meant, in practical terms, that I ended up speaking things on my own that I attributed to the Holy Spirit's operation in me. And, um, you know, it was such a mess, guys. You know, I, I remember that, uh, you know, people, I, I remember seeing people that were uh, starting in that denomination and uh, they were in, not intimidated, but they felt so, uh, so, isolated, you know, if they didn't speak in tongues, that they ended up, in a way or in another, speaking in tongues. And many other things were linked to, to speaking in tongues as a consequence of this uh, quote-unquote baptism in the Holy Spirit. But what does the Scripture say about the Holy, uh, about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is what I want to show you here. We are going to analyze it step by step, okay? So now uh, I have this, um, I have this script here, and again, we're going to see it step by step, and I hope you understand that, okay? The baptism, first thing, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a promise. Let's read Luke 24, 49. Let's go there. Luke 24, verse 49. Words of Jesus, okay? Uh, Jesus is instructing his disciples um, a little before he ascended to heaven to seat at God's right hand, okay? Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high, okay? There are also, in the other Gospels, there are uh, other moments when Jesus promises, but here it is clear, I send the promise of my Father. And as I said, in the other Gospels, you're going to see uh, similar passages, excerpts uh, from the Scripture uh, mentioning this promise, okay? And the promise is that they would receive power from on high, okay? And they would be, uh, they would be receiving the Holy Spirit, uh, we have here, let me check if I'm not mistaken. Acts 1, let me see here. Um, here the disciples ask it, um, a f ask with some, uh, a question to Jesus. Let's read from verse 4, Acts 1, verses 
4 to 8, okay? And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly, truly baptized with water, but you shall, shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the promise is even clearer here. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the king of Israel? Sorry, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, so as I said, you know, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as we could clearly read, is a promise and it takes place not because we're good, not because the disciples or you are good, but because God made this promise, okay? And we're going to read in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, that one acquires it by faith. Let's take a look at this portion of the scripture, Galatians 3, 13 to 14. Let's go there. And it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for, for us, for it is right and curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. And take a look at verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham, what is the blessing of Abraham? This is the blessing of Abraham. When you go back to Genesis, God had promised that all the families of the, of the earth would be blessed by Abraham's seed. This is the blessing, uh, this is the promise, the blessing of Abraham mentioned in Genesis. So let's continue here with Paul. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, so the promise uh, of receiving the Holy Spirit uh, includes us, Christians, members, all the members of the body of Christ, and it is acquired by faith. Let me color it here, by faith. Okay, now... You might be wondering, I'm still not sure if this is really for all. Well, it's clear here that the blessing of Abraham might come upon a Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we, who is we? We, church, members, all members of the body of Christ might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And if you're not happy with this, a portion of the script alone, we can mention Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 39. Let's go there. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God, as many as the Lord our God will call. So, the promise of the Holy Spirit is a promise made to all of those who God calls. Um, when does it happen? Let's go to Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. I hope you're enjoying the, the, the study and all the revelation contained in the scripture. Okay, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 
13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom I also have and believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Let's understand here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. There's a lot of things here, a lot of revelation here. First, one hears a gospel and one believes. And then they are sealed with the Holy Spirit of the promise. So, first, when does it happen? First, one hears a gospel. Okay, you heard the gospel. And then you believe. And then you are sealed. It is clear. Let's read it again. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. What is this word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, I mean, after you believe, you were sealed with that same Holy Spirit of promise. And what is this Spirit of promise? It is a guarantee. Guarantee. It's not a possibility. It is a guarantee given by the sovereignty of the Lord. Uh, concerning our inheritance until the redemption, until the full work of redemption is implemented in us concerning the purchase possession to the praise of his glory. This is what Paul is saying here. So, now we have to face the thing, you know, the, the apparent clear manifestation of the Holy Spirit that would be the gift of tongues. So, first thing we got to understand here, well, I mean, this portion of Ephesians chapter 1, 13, 14 is very clear that the Holy Spirit is a seal, but still there are people that insist on saying that the gift of tongues is the only manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which they never told us uh, what it is exactly, and that we have already studied here uh, in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. So let's understand this gift of tongues issue, okay? First, it is not a, an obvious sign of, of the Holy Spirit of promise. Let's understand that. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 30. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 28 to 30. Listen to what the apostle has to say. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, we're going to understand what prophets are, okay? More, uh, more ahead in this course. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Varieties of tongues. Now, check it out here. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. So, it is clear Paul is saying that with all words and letters. Not everyone in the body of Christ speak with tongues. And not every one of the body of Christ interprets or have gifts of healing or are prophets or are apostles or teachers. These are gifts that are distributed among the body of Christ according to God's sovereign will. And the church in its history um, tended to emphasize, to give way too much importance to some of these gifts, to some of them, 
especially speaking with tongues, especially healing. But it is really interesting that uh, some gifts, they are rarely or never mentioned at church. And I can mention a few of, a few of them here. Uh, let me see if I find here. Okay. Um, Romans 12, 3 to 8. Let me check here with you. Romans 3. This is where the Apostle Paul is going to mention the other gifts. 3, oh, what is it here? 3 to 8. Yeah. Verses 3 to 8. For what if some did not believe? Oh, sorry. Um, wrong, wrong portion. It's 12, chapter 12, 3, 8. Sorry, guys. 12, verses 3 to 8. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think so soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Come on, it's here. Not all members of the body of Christ have the same function. So why do you obligate and force everyone to show that they should speak in tongues, to show that they should heal? It is clear. It, it is the apostolic message. Do not think that you are wiser than the apostle or the apostles. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So we received as many gifts as the grace that is given to us commands us to receive. So let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. It's really strange that I don't see people at church talking about the gift of mercy. I don't see people in church talking about the gift of giving. No, they prefer to pick the gifts that please, that please them most. That is speaking in tongues, that is healing, and some others. Right? So, guys, again, the gifts... They are manifested, they are uh, given to the body of Christ, they are distributed among the body of Christ according to the grace of God that is uh, manifested in each member of the body of Christ according to God's will. Okay, so this is a fact. So don't force other people to manifest the gifts that you in your life say that they are mandatory for the entire congregation. This is a lie, okay? So, um, we, cl we clearly read that not everyone speaks in tongues, okay? So, the gift of tongues is not a sign of, uh, of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, And what is then, Eric, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Okay, let's read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13, and let's allow the Apostle Paul to teach us that. Right? Um, for as, let me see if this is the right reference, 12, 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, 
so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Let us read it again. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many, many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit is... Uh, the action by the Spirit to baptize us, to uh, to make us... What is the verb, my God? Let me put it here because I don't remember it in English. Just a minute. I don't want to use wrong, <laughs> wrong words here. Right. Oh, immersed. Oh, yeah. Right. So... The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the action by the Holy Spirit of baptizing us, of immersing us into one body that is the body of Christ, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and to make all of them drink into one spirit. It is clear now, I believe, right? So all those who believed for the formation of the body of Christ. So, the, the baptism the Holy Spirit, as we read here, is a promise. It encompasses all of those who God calls, right? It is not manifested by the gift of tongues, right? It happens... Uh, after one hears a gospel and believes, and it is a guarantee of, uh, it is a guarantee given by the Holy Spirit of the promise, and it happens by the action of the Holy Spirit of baptizing, of immersing one into the body of Christ for the formation of the body of Christ. Period. Okay? Now, you might be asking yourself, Eric, why then we have those episodes in the book of Acts concerning the repeated uh, events of people speaking in tongues during the manifestations of the Holy Spirit? First, guys, I told you before, but I'm going to say that again. You cannot take the book of Acts and create your theology based on it. Actually, you cannot take any isolated fragment of the Bible and create your theology based on it because the Bible should, you know, each verse should communicate with all the others. So the Bible is an, in, is an integrated material that should uh, communicate each part with the other parts, okay? And specifically concerning the book of Acts, it is a moment of the church. It is a a moment where um, the, where the truths are being uh, are, are being analyzed, are being uh, consolidated at church. Okay, this is a moment of the church where the truths they are being consolidated. So we need to be careful. But even by taking the book of Acts, because we uh, we already heard the. Um, the teachings concerning uh, the gift of tongues, according to the to the full truth of the gospel uh, contained in the epistles, but even by reading the book of Acts alone, we can clearly understand why that happened. You're gonna see uh, that um, the the manifestation of speaking in tongues 
linked to the to the Holy to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it acts and it happens. Sorry, it happens. It took place in four strategic moments and places. This is something you gotta understand here. So the Holy Spirit was poured out in four strategic moments and places. First, with the Samaritans. Second, with the proselyte Gentiles. Uh, sorry, I said four. No, it's three. <laughs> so the, the bap let me correct it. So the baptism with the Holy Spirit happened in the book of Acts, linked with the, with the gift of speaking in tongues, uh, linked with, uh, four, with three different uh, moments and places. First, as I said, with the Samaritans. Second, with the proselyte Gentiles. What are the proselyte Gentiles? Those are Gentiles that identify it uh, with the with the people of Israel, with the law given by Moses, and that uh, sought for the Lord through the Old Testament. Okay, these are gent the proselyte Gentiles. So we had the first manifestation with the Samaritans. Second manifestation with the proselyte Gentiles, and third manifestation with the pagan Gentiles. So if you read the book of Acts attentively, you're going to see that in the beginning, even though they had already received the commandment by Jesus to go to the entire world and to preach the gospel to all nations, all nations, no exceptions, they were kind of hesitating. They didn't want to do that. And why did that happen? Because, you know, even though they had seen Jesus in flesh and heard Jesus' teachings and saw Jesus' miracles and signs and even saw Jesus ascending to heaven to sit at, a, at God's right hand, even then they were filled with concept with concepts and values from the old covenant and that needed to be broken um you know um they were still stuck in the old covenant and uh they were filled with that jewish pride they hadn't uh, understood, or in some cases, they, or in some cases, they hadn't accepted the fact that now God would reach the Gentiles and all other men and women outside of the borders of Israel, of the Jews' locations. Okay, so it was necessary to break that Jewish pride that still dwelled inside the disciples of Christ in the primitive church. And how would God do that? God did that by pouring out the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, not the, uh, not the seal, not the sign, but as the, the speaking in tongues was initially showed by the evidence of speaking in tongues, why? Because God needed to break that Jewish pride inside the disciples of Christ in the primitive church, as I said. And that was evidently manifested in that moment, in that specific moment, through the speaking in tongues in its strategic places. Samaritans, why? Because for Jews, Samaritans were unclean. They were not worthy. The proselyte, the proselyte Gentiles, because even though they sought for God, they heard the, the Old Testament, they were not considered God's chosen people and the pagans so this one this group is even further from god so god manifested the speaking of in tongues in those regions in those locations and in those strategic places and moments because he wanted to break you know the jewish pride and show them that now 
even those people were called by God to be made part of the body of Christ. And we can clearly see that. Let me see. I, I hadn't... Let me see if I can find it here. I hadn't selected here um, this portion of the scripture. Um, uh, um, let me see if it's here. No. Let me search here on the internet. Just a minute. Um, Cornelius. Okay, Acts 10. Oh, right, all right. We are gonna, uh, we're, we're gonna see here a clear illustration of what I had just, of what I have, sorry, of what I have just told you, okay? Um, so, there was a certain man in Zaria called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So he was a proselyte Gentile. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called to his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on to their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about a sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Let's stop it here. You see that even though Peter had received all of what he received from the Lord Jesus Christ, he still kept the old covenant doctrine in his heart. He considered those animals still common and unclean. And he will later on realize that those animals represented the Gentiles and all the nations that even the disciples of Christ at that moment considered unclean, that is, not worthy of the gospel of Christ. Although Christ himself had already commanded the disciples to preach the gospel to the whole world of that time. Right? But let's continue here. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what, what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the man who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the man who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. 
for what reason I have for what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them, sorry, and then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. All right, so now we have here the meeting of Peter with Cornelius. Let's read it here. And the following day, they, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying... Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean so peter understand so sorry so peter understood the meaning of the vision that god had given him before he understood that god referred to the animals um that god used the animals as symbols pointing to the fact that those were gentiles right um so he says, therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius is going to explain everything, right? We're going to skip this part here. And we're going to go right to verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. <laughs> now he realized that after all that Jesus had said, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So here, uh, Cornelius is going to receive the, the gospel through Peter. And what happens then? While Peter was still speaking this word, so Peter hadn't even finished his sermon, his pre his preaching. So while Peter was still speaking with it, so while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. Why astonished? <laughs> Jesus had already commanded them to do that. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So you see how difficult it was for these disciples, these Jewish disciples, to accept the fact that God had embraced all the Gentiles with the gospel. For they heard them speak with tongues. So they could understand that the, the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles through the speaking in tongues. I mean, it was necessary at that specific context uh, that the speaking in tongues took place so that those disciples of Christ had no doubt that the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was being poured out on the Gentiles also. This is going to happen uh, in those other two circumstances with the Samaritans and with the, pan with the pagan Gentiles, okay? So this is why uh, we have these episodes 
of uh, the speaking in tongues in the three different circumstances. And finally, to finish off this issue of the baptism, the Holy Spirit, we have the fact that the baptism, the Holy Spirit, means that one has put on Christ. We're going to read that in Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Let's go there. Galatians 3, uh, 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay? Um, let's go until verse 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. And heirs, according to the promise. I'm so sorry, guys. In my first video, <laughs> I mispronounced this word and I pronounced it as hairs. I'm really sorry about that, you know? <laughs> I've been speaking this tongue, the, oh, sorry, I've been speaking this language, English, for so long, but sometimes, you know, you, <laughs> you run the risk of mispronouncing a word or two. So uh, I'm making a correction here. So to finish it off here, you know, verse 29 again. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay? So, we are closing this parenthesis here <laughs> concerning the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I, and I hope I have clarified this issue to you. Let me close it here. Um. <clears throat> So, I mentioned here the spirit shed. So, uh, economic aspect of the spirit with a view to fulfilling God's promise. So, the Holy Spirit also represents a testimony against the world as if to sealed, uh, as if sealing the sentence of condemnation, as if sealing, I'm corrected here, as if sealing the sentence of condemnation against it. Now, let's be really careful here. Let's read John 16, verse 8 to 11. Mm. John 16, right? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, 16, 8 to 11. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they do not believe in me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Oof, we have a lot here to discuss, okay? Well, firstly, what I can tell you here is that um, often the church um, understand, you know, um, this translation is very good because you can read the verse, the, 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 the verb convict, which is clear in English, right? But in some translations in Portuguese, for example, you see the translation uh, you know, the verb translated as convince, as if uh, the Spirit would try to convince those that are part of the world system, right? Um, and the fact is that, according to the Greek language, electro means to sentence by means of damning, damning evidence, of condemnation evidence. Okay, so... This is one of the aspects, one of the economic aspects of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, he will, um, this is one of the economic aspects of the Holy Spirit. He will testimony against the world. He will convict the world. But what is the world? We understand that it, it, is, it is a conviction. It is not 
the Holy Spirit trying to convince, to convince the world that the world is wrong. But what is the world? The church, as I said, often identifies everyone outside of the church as the world. But is it true? No. We're going to be discussing uh, you know, this issue in more details in other classes. But as I have already uh, taught here, um, the election of the church did not aim to simply choose people that would be saved in detriment to the others that would be condemned. No. The church, the members of the body of Christ were chosen so that they could reach all the other men. As you can read in Genesis, the seed of Abraham that we know according to Galatians that we have just read is the, each member and all the members of the body of Christ. So this seed of Abraham would reach and bless all families of the earth. This has always been God's purpose, to reach every man. But the, the Protestant movement, the, you know, Christianity in general, just like the Jews, uh, <clears throat> just like the Jews became arrogant in their history, and supposed that they were the elected people in detriment to the others that would be condemned. And in doing so, they did not fulfill the, the purpose of God. Just like that, you know, the church of Christ again became arrogant and read the scripture by interpreting that God had simply uh, selected a few people to save them while the majority of the others would be condemned to eternal fire. That's what they understood. But that's not the case. And I am going to show you why. As I said, we'll be addressing this issue in more detail in future classes. But I just want to show you a piece um, of the scripture that will clearly show two different groups in eternity. And that is in Revelation. Okay, let's go to Revelation. This is a topic, again, that we will be discussing in more details ahead, okay? But I'm, ju uh, I'm just giving you a glimpse of uh, these details that we will come across in the future, okay? So here, um, Satan has already been uh, defeated once for all, and he goes to the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death, as we read here, is not a literal lake of fire. Uh, as an evidence, we can mention the fact that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire as well, right? So, you see, uh, and, and then in, in future classes, I'm going to address, uh, you know, this uh, topic of uh, the lake of fire with more details. But it is clear here that even the hell, Hades, and death, that is not tangible, Death was cast into the lake of fire. How is that possible? Is the death a being that could burn in the lake of fire? Obviously not. The death is the absence of life. And it ceased to exist. So the lake of fire is the disconnection from God. It is the eternal eternal condemnation to inexistence. This is the second death. But let's read here, you know, let me go back to my, uh, we, to my original topic here. I came to Revelation to show you uh, 
uh, about um, the, uh, the, the comprehensive plan of God to mankind, right? So let's read it here. John is saying, Then I saw a great white throne, and he who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. So you clearly have here anthropomorphic language. And right in the beginning of the book of Revelation, we're going to read that uh, the, the book of Revelation is composed of many symbols that have meanings which must be understood. Otherwise, you are not going to understand the book and its message, okay? But we're going to deal with the book of, Revela of Revelation in more details ahead, okay? And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Just, let me just make a comment here. These people, the dead, small and great, are all men except the church. Because we learn from the apostles, especially the apostle Paul, that the members of the body of Christ are going to be judged in, um, in another throne, right? They are going to be judged uh, by a familiar, fa familiar throne. It's, so there is going to be a special, special judgment for the church that does not encompass eternal condemnation or eternal life. It only encompasses uh, rewards or discipline during the millennium, right? This is clearly taught in 1 Corinthians. We don't have time to check it out now, but we will be certainly addressing this in the future. Okay, well, I could mention that. Um, I, I don't remember the reference, but let me go quickly over, over it. Um, let me check it here, just a minute, just a minute. Okay, first Corinthians 13, yeah, let's check it here. All right, so don't close Revelation, okay? <laughs> We're going to go back to it later. Um... So, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 to 15. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 to 15. Let's read it here. So, Paul is talking to the church of Christ, okay? For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, pay attention to Paul's words here. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, the day with a capital letter, which is the judgment, the day of the judgment uh, for the members of the body of Christ. Okay, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, Paul is basically saying here that the good works of each member of the body of Christ are like uh, gold, silver and precious stones, and they will be judged by God, and they will remain, for they are good works, works done in Christ, that is according to the purpose of God in Christ, okay? Now, the other works, the other deeds that are not in accordance with the will of God in Christ, these um, will be burned. Let me find here. These will be burned, okay? And the person that offers these 
bad works that are not in accordance with the, in accordance with the will of God in Christ, this person that shows these bad works, these evil works, will suffer loss, but not for eternal condemnation, because it says here, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, why will this person be saved? Because there is a promise that the one that has started the good work in each member of Christ will finish it, right? Even if this person has to go through fire, which is a discipline during the millennium period, which we'll be addressing in the future, okay? So, this Christian that does not have good works to show God, he will be saved, but will have to endure to go through discipline so that he may be ready when uh, eternity starts in Revelation 21 and 22. Okay, now let's go back. Now we know that uh, the church of Christ is not judged according to the possibility of being eternally condemned or eternally saved. It is judged according to its works, and it means that the good works imply uh, a reward during the millennium, while the evil works, the evil deeds of the members of the body of Christ uh, mean discipline during the millennium. Okay, so God will fulfill his salvation work in each member of the body of Christ regardless of his stance here in this dispensation. Even if this person has to endure, has to uh, go through discipline, salvation work will be implemented and performed in each member of the body of Christ. This is a promise. Now, if you love the Lord, you want to be a winning Christian, a victorious Christian now. So, you could serve the Lord not only because of the rewards, but because you love the Lord. And the rewards are a plus that God will mercifully give to you. Okay, now let's go back to Revelation and, and understand God's uh, attitude towards the others that are not members of the body of Christ, but that are, but there are children of God, and that will be judged in a different way, not according to the faith in the Jesus of Nazareth that can only be received as as we read in the gospel through revelation from God, through the capacity that God gives one to believe in the Nazarene, that believe that the Nazarene is the Christ of God. This is uh, believing that the, the Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ of God can only be achieved through the capacity received from God so that this person may believe so. This is given by God, okay? Uh, Jesus is is asking the disciples, who do you say that I am? So Peter goes and says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Peter, because neither blood nor flesh have, have revealed that to you. I mean, so Peter, you understood that not because of your capacity, because of your intelligence, but because of the revelation that was given to you by God, okay? So, being a member of the body of Christ means under, by looking at the Nazarene and understanding that the Nazarene was God himself in flesh. And that could only be understood through revelation given by God, okay? What about the others? The others should be reached by the church that received this special revelation, which did not happen and still doesn't happen properly. But God has a purpose for the other man, and he reveals himself through his common grace to all other men. And all other men are gonna respond to God in this white throne judgment according to, the, uh, to their attitude, to their 
cost her before the level of revelation that they received from God. I hope I'm being crystal clear for you here, okay? So let's read, in, uh, let's read here the other verses. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. According to their works. So we got no conflict here. We got no contradiction here with other passages of the Bible that said that the, the, that salvation can only be uh, accomplished by faith in Christ alone. No, yeah, that, that works in this time for church and salvation is not a passport. Salvation is um, the, the legal uh, aspect of salvation that was achieved at the cross plus the organic salvation that is being implemented in the conscience of each member of the body of Christ here. Okay, now as for the other mans, they didn't receive the capacity, the gift from God to look at the, Naz at the Nazarene and understand that the Nazarene is God. But they received the revelation of God, as we're going to read in Romans chapter 1, either through uh, the nature, either through God manifested in the, in the creation, or through other direct means that God provided for them to see God and understand God in history. I am not saying that all human pathways will... Um, will be considered perfect and lead to God. No, what I am saying is that God knows all the men and women that sincerely sought for the Lord among, uh, uh, along the history of mankind, and He will guide them to Himself. The Christ is much bigger, is much greater in terms of revelation and rich than the Nazarene that acted for, uh, for redemption purposes in a specific time and location of the world, okay? We are going to be discussing that, which is the common grace of God, in more details ahead, okay? So let, let me go back now again here. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. So that, you know, the death and Hades delivered up the dead, all those who were, um, you know, in the three compartments uh, of hell, as we read in the parable of Jesus, right? Um, and even, uh, we can, where is it here? Da, 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 where then? And they were judged. Okay, and they were judged, uh, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. But there's also another passage here. Uh, that says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead. This refers to the demons, right? The demons will also be judged here. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And uh, the reason why I'm telling you that. Uh, the dead gave up, uh, sorry, the, the reason why I'm saying that the sea gave up the dead and these dead are the demons is because uh, you will see many portions of the scripture that point to the fact that uh, the demons, uh, let's say, common dwelling place is, uh, you know, the inner, um, the inner earth. Okay, but this is also something we're going to be discussing in more details ahead, okay? So, and they were judged in each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And 
anyone not found right in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, we have here the possibility, the possibility that someone was not found right in, in the book of life and was cast into the lake of fire. That is not eternal lake of fire, literal lake of fire, but a second death. And I am going to be... Uh, I'm going to be recording another video to talk, to address specifically the issue with the lake of fire, to give the proper foundation in the scripture to what I'm saying here, okay? So now we're going to move on to the, uh, to the next chapter. This is chapter 21. And I'm going to clearly see you that m many of these men and women that were judged in the white in, that were judged in the white throne they were saved and we're going to clearly see two groups here um, and that evidences and proves uh, what I'm saying is correct okay is accurate so now I saw a heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the, and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the, tabern the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God himself will be with them and be their God. Right? Now, uh, we're going to see other verses here that basically uh, complement this first idea. And we'll move on to verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowels filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come. I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Who is the bride? Who is the lamb's wife? The church. This is obvious. There's no question about it, okay? And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. So the, the angel said he would show the Lamb's wife, the bride of Christ, the church, to him, to John. So the angel would show John the bride, the Lamb's wife, the church of Christ. And what happens next? And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city. The great city. It's here. City. Read it, please. The holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. So guys, the new Jerusalem is not a literal city. It is the church of Christ, the members of the body of Christ. Totally, uh, totally adorned for her husband, as we read here in verse 2. What we are going to see next in the other verses are not the, you know, the literal uh, aspects of this literal city. No, all of this material description here concerning the city that we know is the church of Christ relate to spiritual aspects of the church and of the work of salvation implemented by God, right? And finally, you could be wondering, oh, where are the other men that you said that had been saved? So, we're going to read here, after the description of the Holy, Je of the Holy Jerusalem, we're going to read here, verses 12, uh, Sorry, not 12, 22, 23, and 24. But I saw no temple in it. There was no church in it. So if you expect to go to a church forever in eternity, 
because you like the temples, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need for the sun, oh sorry, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. Let's read it step by step here. The city, what is the city? The city, the new Jerusalem, the church of Christ, had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated. Now, people are going to say that in eternity there's not going to be any sun. Come on, guys. This is anthropomorphic language, and this is basically saying that the glory of God will shine through the church to the entire earth, not in a visible manner, not like, not like the light of the sun, but it's in a spiritual meaning. You understand it? Okay, so the city, the New Jerusalem, the church of Christ will need no sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who were saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. So there is going to be a church, okay, city, and there is going to be nations who are saved, who have been saved by the Lord, that shall walk in his lights, in his light, sorry, that shall walk in his light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. I hope you have understood what I try to say here. So, uh, now we're, we, we're almost finishing, okay? <laughs> I realize that I've been speaking here for more than one hour and a half, but I'm, I'm about to finish now. So, there is going to be the formation of the body of Christ. So, uh, we read that, you know, we read in other portions of the scripture that it is the Holy Spirit that works in the body of Christ, right? to form it. We, we read it in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 13. I will not read it again. We have already read this portion. And um, concerning the building of the church, we know about the spiritual gifts. So I will not explain gift by gift now. Okay? This is going to be done in future classes. Okay? But for now, it is important that we uh, revise uh, Roman, Romans 12, chapter 12, verses 3 to 8, in which we read about um, the gifts, right? The spiritual gifts given to the church. And we read that these gifts were prophecy, ministry of service in the general sense, teaching, exhorting, generosity, leadership, and mercy. Okay, and these spiritual gifts, as we have already read, they were given for a specific purpose. They were not given so that uh, some could boast because they have certain gifts while the others do not have them. No, the purpose uh, behind the gifts, the spiritual gifts, uh, distributed among the church is to help, to assist in the building of the church, right? So this is pretty clear. We have a read, uh, already, sorry, we have already read about that and I'm not going to read again, okay? In the constitution of ministers and officers in the church, let's just take a look here at um, Acts 13, 1. Acts. I am about to finish, so stick with me a little longer, and it's going to be worth it. 
Acts 13, 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they, were, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Okay? So, we clearly see that the, the, um, the Holy Spirit has a role of constituting ministers, specific ministers and officers at church, right? We don't have to read these other verses here uh, because, you know, they will basically complement this idea. And finally, we have already gone uh, over these verses, but, you know, this, uh, the Holy Spirit works in the consummation of the divine work, His supreme purpose. So, we have already read that the Holy Spirit works to build the church, right? And to edify the church. And consequently, it uh, has a role in the consummation of this divine work that we read about in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. When John has the vision of the church of Christ descending from heaven to earth okay well guys so this is it um i'll be releasing the next class soon and then we'll go on to another topic okay i really hope you have enjoyed that may the lord bless you and see you in our future class